Oh, welcome. Um, this is Charlie. This is the podcast To Hell and Back. And uh, welcome. Um, it's Thursday, March 4th, 6 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time in Northampton, Massachusetts, where I'm sitting. Uh, and uh, yeah, I just, there's just several things. I just, you know, starting this podcast today, it's a little interesting to me because um, I have a whole bunch of things I want to tell you and they're all on my mind at once. And I was thinking how crazy that is, you know, when we have a lot of things on your mind at once, but you have to tell them sequentially. Uh, and so I just want to tell you everything at once and be done with it, like, <laughs> because it's all on my mind, but it's going to take a while to get it out there to you. And so I'm going to talk uh, about, um, that in a minute and you'll and actually that's interesting itself it's related to the topic um yeah what do i want to start and tell you about is that uh i want to i want to make a couple reminders <clears throat> that i don't say very frequently but first i want to tell you that this podcast that i do which by the way i looked on my own website and i saw this is number 81 uh podcasts they started in the september of 2017 um and uh and so in doing them, from the beginning, this was a collaboration with the support of NEABPD, National Education Alliance of Borderline Personality Disorder. And the, and the president of that at the time, Perry Hoffman and I, who were very good friends, she's passed away by now, but we, I started the podcast in conjunction with her and with the support of um, Mark Pierce, who, is, uh, who manages my website and also manages this podcast and also manages the NEABPD website. So I just wanted to mention that because I don't stop and give them credit, but they've been supporting this all along. And um, yeah, in spirit, it's very much a collaboration with them and in, and in the spirit of their mission. Second thing, I just wanna say, who is this podcast aimed at? And this is not just for this week, but it's for all the weeks that I do these. And from the beginning, the intention was, I, I sort of have found out and, anticipated that there's two populations of people that listen to these podcasts. One are people who actually know DBT. They're either DBT therapists, they're DBT patients, they work in programs where DBT is done, or they're family members of people who are in DBT. So there's the people who are, you might say, the DBT savvy people. And then there's people who know nothing about DBT. And that was actually the intention of this podcast is to bring uh, skills and strategies and principles that come from the world of DBT, a treatment developed to sort of help people who are really chronically suffering and to the point of self-harm and suicide, but actually the tools, the skills, the strategies, the principles are so um, user-friendly for anybody and so that they really can be used for human adversity in general. So the other population is people that don't know DBT. So you'll sometimes find uh, I, that I have to walk a line between the two because um, I know that a number of things I'm saying are already well known to people who know DBT well, but they aren't necessarily known to other people. So I try, I, I hope that you can bear with me if you're uh, in either of those categories <laughs> and sort of trying to do both things. Um, all right. Um, you know, I was thinking this, this podcast is about, um, you probably saw the title of it or you wouldn't be listening or watching, but it's about uh, the reasons why it's so hard to regulate emotions. And, you know, that includes that it's hard to regulate emotions just even if it's like one emotion that you have that's hard to regulate or one context in which it's hard to regulate emotions. Um, but that they're really hard. And that's true of almost all human beings. And then there's people who um, have what you chronic and severe difficulties of regulating emotions and where it crosses several emotions and it crosses several domains of their lives and it really impacts their lives heavily. And then there's everything in between sort of. Um, so um, these techniques uh, which came about in trying to help the latter group of people, the chronic and severe emotional dysregulation, uh, are actually helpful for everybody uh, with whatever degree and however frequent and however circumscribed or however severe emotion dysregulation is. So I was thinking about it before the podcast today. Here's just a tiny preview of 
today plus next week, because next week is a little bit of a follow-up for t- from today. Um, I was, uh, before I started the podcast today, I'm experiencing some anxiety telling you this. Um, I, I uh, to go back, uh, even though I've done a lot of these podcasts and I've done a lot of teaching, every single week that I do a podcast, I start getting anxious before the podcast. I mean, I experience anxiety in my body uh, and, and it just sort of, I start thinking, oh, there's, how am I gonna start? What am I gonna say? Uh, what am I gonna cover? Is, it, is this interesting at all? Is this gonna help people at all? Are people gonna relate to this? And I get into, a, I don't get into a, quite a frenzy, but I get into a state that's definitely an elevated anxious state. And so, you know, for some time, what I have done, and also because these are heading into my evening, um, is that I will have a glass of wine before I start or at the beginning of starting. I mean, if anybody's watching rather than listening, here's my wine right now. So here I am drinking wine while I'm doing a podcast. And I was thinking about that today, just a while ago, and thinking, you know, This is emotion, this is a a minor version of emotion dysregulation of two types. One is the dysregulation of anxiety and fear before the podcast. So what do I do? I drink a glass of wine. Nothing terrible about that. I don't have an alcohol problem, but it it just, it takes the edge off of my anxiety. And, um, uh, but, and, and, and so that's one emotion dysregulation, you might say of a minor nature. Uh, and then I have a strategy, which is that I'll drink some wine. So my action urge is to drink some wine to regulate my anxiety. Um, and secondly, I realized that I've never, I've never indicated on the podcast that I drink a glass of wine. Not that I need to, not that I have to, but I just realized that I actually deliberately don't mention it and don't make the wine visible. And that, and that, why do I do that? You know. If you're an aficionado of this sort of emotion regulation model in DBT, then you already know that it's because I'm having an emotion and I'm regulating my emotion. And the emotion is shame, uh, that I have some embarrassment, that I have some factors in me that make me vulnerable to having shame for drinking a glass of wine, which is actually not detrimental at all in reality. But in my mind, I have to do something about it. Why? Well, I'm vulnerable because, for one thing, I grew up in a family where there was alcoholism and I have a lot of feelings about it. Secondly, I uh, am in a society where, at least as I've picked up in my life and in the circles I've been in, one doesn't mix um, uh, drinking wine or alcohol with work. And so it feels like, oh no, I'm doing something wrong. Uh, and, and third, I'm anxious. So I have vulnerability factors. Then I have a prompting event and the prompting event is getting myself a glass of wine, right? And, and then I, once I get uh, a glass of wine, now I, um, I, I, I experience like, oh, oh, this is the wrong thing to do. And how do I regulate that? I, I, I have this action urge to hide that, which is typical of shame. And so then I don't say anything about it. And then I realized, But by doing that, it perpetuates it. It perpetuates the idea that there's a problem. Even though I don't actually in reality think there's a problem, I perpetuate the feeling of shame by acting on the urge to hide it. Um, And so I I don't wanna make more of this or less of this than it is because this isn't a severe problem, but it is the basic idea and you'll hear about laying this out with, with more severe problems. Um, And then, um, but, and I guess one of the points and the final point I wanna make about this is something that Marsha Linehan would always say when she taught about emotions, uh, which is one of the reasons it's so hard to regulate emotions. And it's not one of my 10 reasons exactly. It's sort of a more global reason is that emotions love themselves is the way Linehan would put it. Emotions love themselves. What's that mean? Well, this is a minor example of it because the, the emotion of shame gets one to hide whatever one's ashamed of. And once you hide what you're ashamed of, it perpetuates the idea that it's shameful. And so now you're gonna continue to have shame. So the action urge to hide something when you're ashamed 
actually perpetuates shame into the future and it doesn't do a thing about changing it. So that's one example. Also, the, 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 the interpretation of having a glass of wine when you're gonna do a podcast is that, uh, oh my God, I'm doing something wrong. Or, oh my God, you know, uh, this is gonna, what's, what, I'm going downhill or something like that. And so then you realize that, that those ideas perpetuate the hiding, which perpetuates the shame. So actually, many, many, many of the factors that are part of an emotion, the complexity of an emotion, uh, call for the emotion to continue into the future. And there'll be more themes of that. So you really, when you regulate emotions, you, I mean, you, you want to have awareness of emotions. Uh, and you want to have awareness of what keeps perpetuating the emotion, especially if it's a difficult one to change. Uh, and then you often have to do things to inhibit what you feel like doing or what you feel like thinking or what naturally comes to you to do. So you kind of have to go against your emotion sometimes in order to regulate your emotion. So I'm just starting there, but now I want to get jump back and uh, say, here's what I'm doing today. That was a little preview, you might say, or just a little example of just comes up. Um, those of you who know DBT, and who know DBT skills know about a certain model of emotions, which is in a certain handout, in a certain module of the curriculum, uh, emotion regulation module, handout number five. And, and actually we're gonna, uh, I'm gonna introduce that now, but I'm not gonna teach that per se, but the, those of you who know it are gonna hear that that's exactly where this is coming from. Because I've been thinking about what does make it so hard to regulate an emotion? And that handout presents what you might say from a DBT point of view is the architecture of an emotion or the anatomy of an emotion, the infrastructure of an emotion. It's the essential ingredients of an emotion. And it's a bunch of ingredients. And so all of those ingredients together make up the emotion. Um, so if you wanna be changing your habitual pattern of being trapped in certain emotions, whether it's sadness, deep sadness that you cannot escape from and it's really affecting your life or deep fear or anxiety or shame or guilt or envy or whatever it is that's causing you so much trouble and you get trapped in it like being on a roller coaster, locked in and unable to get out, um, then it really helps uh, if you can't just naturally deal with it, it helps to have this framework, this architecture, so you can see all the components that are working together to uh, create and perpetuate an emotion. And then you can start to think about which of these components you could do something about. Um, you know how I said at the beginning of this uh, podcast that uh, I have all these things on my mind, I wanna present them all at once, even though they, I'm gonna have to present them sequentially. That's a little bit like this model of emotions. And those of you who teach it, maybe you don't think of it this way because I've only recently come to thinking about it this way, is that the way that this um, architecture is laid out that has these components of emotions is laid out from left to right on a page with arrows in, in a way that suggests that this is a sequential model that goes from vulnerability factors to prompting events to and sensations in the body and thoughts and then action urges and so on and so on. And it's sequential. And I've always thought of it that way and taught it that way. But you know, in fact, when you think about it, um, it's really, this is a really uh, an all at once kind of thing because emotions don't take place sort of slowly and sequentially where you could sort of find the dividing line between the different components. It sort of happens more like this. <laughs> Like you have a lot of things happen at once with an emotion, that's how they're built. They're, we're hardwired to have emotions and they happen instantaneously, automatically, spontaneously, and they just flow within like within milliseconds, you've had everything, you've had all the components of the emotion. So for you to say, oh, well, here's the sequence of the emotions. It's in, in a way that's a helpful way to think of it because you can lay it out and it makes sense but it actually doesn't 
fit the reality. The reality of an emotion is all these things happen at once, sort of like a collage of different components that all happen at once and they all affect each other. So that if you change any one of them, it can feed back and change all of the others. So I would suggest that even though this is a sequential model of how emotions work step by step by step, it's also helpful for you to think, no, actually, this is just a bunch of factors that act like an orchestra of creating an emotion. You know, in an orchestra, you know, you've got all the different sections of the orchestra and they all play at the same time and they, every time they play, they affect each other. It's more like that. So this is an orchestra that creates an emotion as well as a sequence uh, as a way of talking about it. So what are the 10 factors? In, in sort of order um, of how they're usually presented. Well, the first three, um, and by the way, I'm gonna be laying out all these difficulties or, the, or where you find trouble in trying to regulate emotions without providing the solutions today so much. The solutions are in the DBT manual, but next week I'm gonna be joined by three DBT therapists who also teach skills all the time. And, and they're gonna talk about in practical terms, how do they use this model to jump off and help people change certain things about their emotions? So I'm not gonna be burdened with all of everything today, just here's the 10 factors and I'm gonna be running through them now. So the first three factors are all in the category, you might say, of vulnerability factors. They're the things that render a person vulnerable to something happening that triggers an intense emotion. So what makes people vulnerable? I've sort of subdivided it into three categories. So the first is biological factors. Biological factors are huge in making you emotionally vulnerable. What do I mean by biological factors? Well, first of all, you can think of psychiatric diagnoses, each of which carries with it a certain biology. So people with major depression, uh, when it's activated, uh, have trouble regulating lots of emotions. Uh, and so there's a syndrome going on, there's biological pathology going on, you might say, or some sort of circuitry issues that make it hard to regulate an emotion. A, a, pro, a, a really prominent anxiety disorder makes it hard to regulate emotions. PTSD carries its own biology with it in the nervous system. That makes it hard to regulate an emotion. A bipolar disorder obviously makes it hard to regulate an emotion. So there's all these diagnoses. Like for instance, um, not long ago, I was seeing somebody who had a major depression and she had trouble regulating, I won't go into the details, but several different emotions. Like she, everything would end up like not regulated very well and would really mess her up uh, through no fault of her own. Uh, but she was battling with a depression that wasn't being treated effectively. I'm also a psychiatrist, so I was uh, treating her with medications. And, and there was a certain point when, when we tried a medication we had not tried before. And oh my God, like three weeks later, I'm talking to her, realize I'm talking like to a different person, a regulated person, a person who's very mature and interesting and funny and she can get in and out of different topics without breaking into tears or being furious or being irritable. I mean, it's just changed the day. So her biology had been interfering for a long time and other people don't get that. And then they think that she's doing this on purpose or that she should be able to control herself. So biology is a huge factor if it's a psychiatric diagnosis. The other reason biology is a huge factor is just that, you know, if your physiology is in some way dysregulated, and I'll tell you what I mean, um, then that can create problems with regulating your emotions. So let's say you've been going sleepless for a couple of nights. You start out with something happens, you're upset about it, maybe you usually get a better sleep, but you go through a night where you don't sleep very well, you're tired, you slug through the next day, you go to bed, you're ruminating, you can't go to sleep, it's still on your mind, you lose two or three nights of sleep now that person on the third day after losing sleep for a while, and some people are chronic losers of sleep, um, is, is physiologically dysregulated. There's no question about it. And then it's hard to regulate most emotions. If somebody is uh, off in their eating from what their nutritional needs are or the rhythm of, of what they need to eat, 
you know, then they're then they get off physiologically and it's hard to regulate emotions, right? And if somebody is getting no exercise ever, no activity ever, so there's no rhythm back and forth between rest and output and rest and output, it's sort of also, it's sort of like sets the stage for the, being feasted upon by emotions growing and getting bigger and out of control. Um, so that that's another type of biological problem. Um, and so obviously, if you if that's the thing that's making it hard to regulate emotions, then um, the, the 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 part of, part of your treatment or part of you trying to get yourself to regulate emotions is going to be to address whatever's throwing it off. It could also be illness, and sometimes illness comes on. You don't even know you're ill yet, but you know you're emotionally dysregulated, and then later you find out you have an infection, and the emotional dysregulation was part of that or people who've had serious illnesses like cancer, uh, where they can become emotionally dysregulated. If you're taking drugs for any of these things, you can get emotionally dysregulated because you're on the drugs and it's just, you're not having your usual uh, physiology. So, and so there's all these things um, and, um, and it reminds you that mood regulation, emotion regulation is fairly reliant on physiological balance, uh, biological balance, uh, maintaining biological rhythms, circadian rhythms and everything. If you move to a different air, if you go to a different part of the world, you know, you could be emotionally uh, vulnerable, emotionally at risk for a while until you've adjusted to a new time zone. So number one, biology can be a huge disruptor of your ability to regulate emotions and you need to know that and do something about it if you can. And as a psychiatrist, I know how hard it can be even to do one, like to fix sleep problems. Secondly, what also renders you vulnerable is your psychological history. If you have a history of trauma, uh, then the world might be filled with cues that trigger you back into your traumatic reaction and then you're caught in certain emotions like fear or panic or anger or whatever it is. If you have profound loss, serious loss, or you've been very sensitized to loss in your life by what's happened to you. Now, you know, life is filled with losses, with separations, with saying goodbye, with endings. It's just tough, you know, to, it's the inevitability of losses. And so if you have had sensitivity, if you're sensitized to loss, it's gonna be harder to regulate your emotions. It's gonna be important to know that and to see if you can, um, be able to grieve uh, more effectively or more deeply than you have already. Uh, if your life's been disrupted by things a lot, now you're also probably going to be more vulnerable to emotional dysregulation. Um, if you've been in a serious, significantly invalidating environment in your life uh, very much, then you may have internalized a pattern of self-invalidation or just be alert and vigilant and uh, uh, easily triggered by, an, by situations in the environment that somehow touch on what you went through when you were younger. Like I just recently consulted uh, on, on the treatment of, of someone who grew up in a very depriving and austere and highly critical uh, environment. And this person, when exposed to criticism, even minor criticism in his current life, from other people of not doing things correctly, uh, then it would activate the internal self-critic in a very rigid and black and white way and would lead then to withdrawing from the world and having a lot of self-castigating thoughts, shame, embarrassment, anger, and, and memories of the past. So it's hard to regulate emotions, right? So the, all of these things. Then there's something a little more subtle than that, which is that maybe you weren't formally traumatized, maybe you weren't formally and exposed to severe losses yet in your life, um, or, or maybe you weren't severely invalidated, but there's a configuration to how you grow up. There's a narrative in, in there's, a life, there's a story in your life. So maybe you have the story of the uh, somewhat critical parent, um, and that's gonna lead to some degree of enhanced uh, self-criticism or shame, or maybe perfectionism. Then you might have uh, a neglectful family situation where you've learned to take care of yourself, but in your life, if you're exposed to contexts that feel neglectful or you feel neglected, 
even though you've found ways to cope with it and compensate for that, still you're vulnerable to situations that can set off that pattern. Or if you grow up in a family where you're overshadowed by siblings uh, who are highly accomplished or whatever, and, and, and you grow up with a feeling of envy, you might be carrying that um, vulnerability to envy the rest of your life. And in which case that you're doing okay, doing okay. And then you run into a situation where somebody triggers that envy and then you get going in that. And then you start getting ruminating about that. And then you start castigating yourself about that. And then you're angry at the world about that. So that, you know, these things don't come out of nowhere, but it's just, uh, and, and I'm not, there's nothing rocket science like that I'm presenting right now, but it just, to me, it has helped personally to have this framework. So when I'm having trouble, I'm caught in a, I, I get caught in guilt sometimes, I get caught in sadness sometimes, I get caught in irritation sometimes, I get caught in envy sometimes. And when I do, and I, then I realize it, I step back sometimes and I think this through and think what is keeping me going, all right? What's making it hard to regulate this? The third category of vulnerability factors is the context in which you are now. So depending who you are, given your background, given your biology, given your history psychologically, you know, some contexts may be more dysregulating than others. For instance, um, I, I've, as, as some of you know, who's listened to the podcast, I've, you know, I've raised two uh, boys into their 20s at this point. Growing up, one of them really liked going into New York City and all of the lights and the excitement and the stimulation that's going on. The other one couldn't stand it. He wanted to get out as quick as he could and get back to a place that was sort of more spacious and serene and quiet and everything. And, um, and so they just had very different nervous systems in that context. So the one that's overstimulated in a certain context is now gonna have more trouble regulating emotions. Um, and so people seek out different contexts. People are aggravated by different contexts. People who are really extroverts like the context of interacting with other people, a group of people for a, a while, it actually energizes them. Whereas the person who's uh, the introvert is that in that situation, it actually drains them in 20 minutes. They, they wanna go home. It's just too much. Um, so some contexts are loaded with triggers, you know, for a given person, um, like people with social anxiety. And you're in a situation where you're expected to interact with people and have exchanges with people of some kind, you know, it can really make you very anxious and, uh, and have a lot of other dysregulation of emotions. Um, people who have eating disorders, and there's, they go to a party or they go to an event or a dinner and it's a buffet dinner and there's food everywhere. I mean, this, this can be a very triggering context for, for people and they have trouble regulating themselves. So I just wanna say, to summarize, if you look at your biology, if you look at your psychological history and you look at the context that you're in, you get an array of factors that within those three larger factors that really can help explain sometimes why you're having so much trouble regulating emotions and you might need to attend to that. What's the next thing? You've got these vulnerability factors, it renders you vulnerable. So in the sequential model of what I'm talking about, the next thing that would come would be a prompting event, a, a, an encounter with reality that uh, sets off an intense emotion. So let's just look at the, before the intense emotion comes, just the encounter with reality, because this is another big factor. Like what kind of encounters with reality is a person having? Um, I have various thoughts about this when I, when I work with people in skills training and in treatment, uh, is that uh, there's some people that don't, that don't really uh, author their own prompting events in their life. And so they're always at the mercy of whatever prompting events come their way, you might say. It's not quite as simple as that. But you know, they, it's like people who have their own agenda and they're building their life or they're building their agenda or they have something they do in a routine way so that they, they have kind of like at least been a participant or co-participant in, you might say, stocking their life with prompting events 
uh, that they're familiar with or that they want or that are meaningful to them. Um, it's a little bit like people who go fishing and they want to make sure and catch fish, so they, they stock the pond with fish. Now they can catch fish. Well, you want to stock your life with prompting events. And uh, whether it's big time projects or whether it's long term goals or whether it's just something you do in a routine way, if you don't have that, if you're deprived of having prompting events that you were co participating in, putting together, then you might be at more risk of encountering prompting events that trigger you more. Um, secondly, when you do encounter a prompting event, what would be a prompting event? My prompting event that I started this podcast with today was, you know, if I, before a podcast, and I'm about to, to work on a podcast, and I pour myself a glass of wine, that can be a prompting event for shame for me. And <laughs> didn't stop me from having a sip of wine. Um, so you, um, that would be a prompting event. Prompting event for somebody who's a kind of self-critical would be to get e even minor criticism from someone in the environment. That could be a big prompting event. Um, uh, a prompting event for somebody who's very lonely is that they once again are walking into the, alone into their apartment. Um, and all kinds of prompting events, you know what I mean. So once you have a prompting event, um, if, if you don't realize that you could modify the prompting event, you're kind of stuck with it. If you don't realize that it's okay to sometimes avoid a prompting event, you're sort of stuck with it. And, in, and with a prompting event, there's the issue of how aware are you of the fact that you have these prompting events and, that, and where they came from. And the more aware you are of these things, the more control you might be able to exert over the prompting events. And the more you can use attention, maybe the, the, maybe the most valued life skill in regulating emotions of all, and there's many, would be the capacity to regulate your attention. Because if you can shift your attention to a different aspect of the prompting event, or you can shift your attention to a different prompting event, uh, or you can downplay the prompting event, all of these have to do with how do you regulate your attention uh, and that can help you, um, you know, focus on what part, like, let's say you are somebody who's been traumatized in the past by a certain kind of person, a person with a certain profile. And now you know you're going to show up somewhere and there's somebody who has something like that profile is going to be there. And you, but you have to go because it's an obligation of your work or social commitment or something like that, or family commitment. And so you just think, oh, no, I'm going to be exposed to this these prompting events with this person that I don't want to have anything to do with. If you are aware that you could use your attention and you could use some decision making to regulate your relationship to the prompting event, I might call it prompting event treatment, then you actually have can exert a lot more control over what emotions you end up with or the level of intensity. So if you don't realize that, uh, sometimes you just feel like, well, I'm stuck with my life as it is. I'm stuck with this prompting event as it is. I'm stuck with having to go to a party. Well, actually, maybe you go to a party and you hate going to parties, but maybe there's a way to manage this big prompting event uh, in a way that's more favorable to you. Um, so, there's, so there's biology, there's psychology, there's uh, context. Then there's the prompting event, and there's a lot of different opportunities for prompting event management, you might say. Now, what's next? Well, what's next is, let's just go there. I could go in three different directions, but one of the factors is that actually the emotion gets into your body. In fact, I might claim that the core, the core ingredient of your emotional response is one that's taking place in your body, that emotions elicit, they are at their core, a bodily response with some other factors there too. That there is the body, there is the uh, tension that comes with certain kinds of anxiety, there's the heart rate that comes with anxiety, there's the sinking stomach that might come with disappointment or sadness, there's the cringing feeling that might come with uh, being ashamed, um, there's a certain repulsed feeling that comes with disgust. Um, every um, 
every emotion has, and, and, and these are not necessarily the same for everybody, but everybody has their own signature uh, bodily response, their autonomic nervous system, their just proprioception, the feeling of what's going on in their bodies and in their heads, their neck, their faces, that all of this is like, like the, the emotion inhabits you phys physically. So why is that important? Why is that an important factor that makes it hard to regulate emotions? The, the main thing is that a lot of people, a lot of us, and about a lot of emotions, just don't even recognize that, don't pay any attention to that, and we get stuck in our heads. And so we're just thinking about our thoughts, and I'm about to get to that as a, as a fifth factor in just a minute, or sixth factor, I guess. Because one, once the thoughts can take over, and then, and you might even forget that actually you have a body. And if you can be aware that you have this body and you can just sort of like, if you're anxious, rather than thinking, oh my God, I'm going to die. Oh my God, I'm going to die. Or, oh my God, I'm going to lose all of my friends. Or, oh my God, this is a terrible thing about me. Rather than getting caught there, you could take a detour into your body and just sort of have, you might say, somatic awareness and really ground yourself in noticing and saying, yeah, boy, I'm noticing my heart's really, what's really happening here? for real is that my heart's pounding heavily. What's really happening is I'm sick to my stomach. I mean, these are things I know that are happening. I'm, I'm making these up. These aren't sort of like myths or fantasies or assumptions. You know, ground yourself back in what's real, physiological, physical, somatic. And sometimes that can sort of settle you in and settle you down. And if you don't, you just forget you have a body. You just are sort of flying, flying uh, and feel out of control. Uh, and, and tortured by thoughts and tortured by your environment and tortured by the decisions you make of what actions you impulsively take. But if you can ground yourself in your body, you can slow this process down, settle it down and be mindful of what's going on. So that that's another factor, the sort of lack of awareness of the body can be another factor that perpetuates the problems of, dysregul of regulating emotions. Now I mentioned thoughts, so obviously, at the same time that you're having bodily responses, you're having interpretations. You can't do without them, actually. I mean, and there's nothing pathological about this. Um, we all tell ourselves things about what's going on in our lives. Our, our minds are constantly narrating. We know what's going on. So we're telling ourselves a story about why this person didn't show up for lunch, why this person didn't respond to a text, and why this person criticized me or why this person doesn't act like they like me that much anymore. And how am I gonna interpret that? Well, we all interpret, we are just automatically, we just have very, very busy interpreters in our brain. And we generate assumptions, we generate beliefs, we generate myths about what's going on. And we try to discern reality, but often our minds are just chattering. And that can be, and for some people, the hardest thing of all about trying to regulate emotions is that the mind is actually doing a sort of a rapid fire under the surface narration that takes over the mind. Um, I had a thing happen a few days ago where one of my sons applied for a certain part-time job he really wanted and he didn't get it. And, and uh, he had his heart set on it and I had my heart set on his heart and his heart set was set on that. So I had my heart set on it too, more than I even knew. And then when I heard that he didn't uh, get it, um, I, I, it was like in the e early evening, I started ruminating about thinking, oh no, oh no, how's this going to be? What's he going to do? He's at a big transition point in his life. Is he going to build a life? Is he going to find what he wants to do? I really, it really uh, flew out of control in my mind. I would have been way better off if I just grounded myself in my bodily reactions. Um, and actually what I ended up doing was uh, watch, uh, because I couldn't get my mind off this, uh, and I didn't want to get my mind off this, and yet I was being tortured by it. Uh, so I ended up putting a, a watching a, a Netflix uh, TV show that I had been watching and sort of binge watching on and very caught up in the story. And I thought maybe I'll get caught up in the story. And I did get caught up in the story. And by the, by the time I watched one hour of this thing, I was, be I was better. It was still there. And actually it interrupted my sleep during the night and stuff. But um, so uh, 
what we are saying to ourselves and what we're ruminating about and how we perpetuate things by thinking into the future of what's going to happen or thinking to the past of how dare this have happened or how terrible that this happened in my life and I'll never repair it. This kind of thinking is just seems normal for human beings, but it can be torturous and it can make it hard to regulate emotions. We have to somehow do something about that. So we've got, what do we have so far? Biology, psychology, context, prompting events, um, the bodily feature, essential ingredient of an emotion, and the interpretations that are going on. Now, what's next? Well, next is the action urge. Every intense emotion comes sort of like built, have a built-in action urge. And there are some ones that are the most likely that you would have with a given emotion, but actually people end up with their own particular action urges uh, that, that are different than somebody else's action urge with the same emotion. So that, um, you know, action urge with shame, as I talked about at the beginning of the podcast, is typically to hide things or to not expose things. The action urge for fear is to run, uh, get away from things. The action urge for uh, anxiety for some people is to control things uh, or to be perfect. Um, the action urge for uh, anger is to uh, attack things. The action urge for sadness is to sort of retreat into your self and sort of um, maybe pull away from other people or, or to cry in front of other people and it elicits comfort from other people. But um, each emotion has its action urge. Um, sometimes you don't notice that, you're just, but you get caught in it. And the problem with action, our action urges can be a huge problem if you don't recognize that's what's going on. You're, you're in an emotion, and next thing you know, you want to do something. Now, action urges are really tough to change a lot because uh, emotions came about because they have functions, and they are powerful, instantaneous events that recruit our entire self towards an end rapidly. So the end might be to fight. The end might be to run away. The end might be to hide. The end might be to cry. The end might be to break things. And you get caught in a certain action urge, which is there as part of your emotion. And often action urges are exactly what you need. Like they are accurately connected to reality in such a way that, you know, the action urge is gonna help you do what you need to do to solve the problem. Other times, action urges are actually going to make things worse. So you kind of have to be aware, oh, I'm caught in this action urge. And as soon as you say that, you bring mindful awareness to, the, to your action urge. You're, um, you're having an action urge and you're aware you're having an action urge, which is two different things. Now you can make choices about what you do with that action urge. Do you want to indulge that action urge? Because actually it's right on target and, and you need the energy and it's, and it's going to get you to do the right thing. Or, or, or do you need to channel the action urge in a somewhat different direction or make use of the energy of the action urge, but not do exactly what the action urge is, but do something in that direction? Or do you need to block the action urge because it's just going to be an impulsive action that's going to make things worse? Or do you need to actually act opposite your action urge in order to try to get things to go in a different direction and generate a different emotional response. So you have a lot of choices, but usually most of us get caught in an action urge. And then we don't have that kind of in the moment awareness. It's hard to get it. But if you can stand back from it, it's sort of like one of the most valuable things you can do to change emotions or to regulate emotions is to have that capacity when necessary to block your impulsive action urge. Um, because uh, it could be that that just is what keeps your trouble going. And then you do something and it just leads to another problem. So action urges are a very important component of this. And I think of the things that I was listing, I think that's like number eight. Um, and then there's like face, then there's expressions of your emotion. So if you're continuing along this sequential model, you've got vulnerability factors, then a prompting event, then the th bodily sensations, uh, thoughts, interpretations, action urges, and now the expression of the emotion. How are emotions expressed? As we know, in a million ways. I mean, in, in, but generally, in the, the, our, we have facial expressions that convey our emotion. 
we have nonverbal expressions of our body that express emotions. Uh, we have actions that express emotions and we have words that express emotions. So all of these things are expressive and so they're, and they're all valuable in different ways at different times. And they're all just present. I mean, it's part of the equipment of being a human being. And yet, and yet, um, some forms of expression might make things worse and might actually perpetuate an emotion or trigger another emotion that's just as difficult. Um, and other expressions might be more skillful in accomplishing whatever you want to accomplish and, key, and not getting you in more trouble or not perpetuating an emotion. So um, the, the presence of the whole, all the expressions is just another factor to look at and say, gee, I wonder if I'm making things worse by my expression, if that's keeping it going. Because you know what? What's interesting about expressions is that you may think, um, like, like if you could uh, and get, you know, express something that you're expressing it to someone else, or you're even by yourself, and that 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 that's fine. Um, you're certainly entitled to express things. But the other thing going on when you are doing emotional expressiveness is your own brain is watching you, your own brain is listening to you, your own brain is sensing what you're sensing what you're doing and so your brain's interpreting so if you were to for instance if 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 there's something that you're afraid of even if it isn't dangerous but you've gotten in a lifelong pattern of running away from certain situations or certain triggers because you're frightened because of some early event or some way you had of thinking about this and now you're in, you're in a long time pattern of running away when you're afraid now if you run away again your brain is watching you run away. And, is, and the brain can interpret that automatically as, oh, there must be something dangerous. I'm running away. He's running away. <laughs> he and I are running away. And so the brain's sort of interpreting this and saying, oh my God, there's something dangerous. And so it perpetuates the concept that there's something dangerous, even if there's not something dangerous. Gee, I better stay in my house. Because if I go out of my house, uh, I'm in danger. Even if there's no real danger there, it might be just as dangerous in your house as out on the street. And so you stay in your house. And every time you make that choice to stay in your house, your brain notices that and says, oh yeah. And then you remain safe. And then you feel like, oh, thank God I stayed in my house because look, I'm still safe. I live, I live another day. But actually what you've done is also perpetuate the fear of going outside. And there's a million versions of this. So how you express is really important. Final thing, um, and there may be 11 things. <laughs> um, so one more thing is, uh, the, is when you do express emotions, the world around you uh, might respond or receives you and might reinforce some of your expressions of emotion. And by doing that, they might reinforce your emotions. So people that you grew up with, people that you hang out with might reinforce you for having and expressing certain emotions. And once you get caught in that loop, even if you don't know you're in it, you've been reinforced maybe 150 times for being angry because when you're angry, people back off from you and they tend to defer to you. So you're being reinforced for your anger. Maybe you're being reinforced for breaking into tears and being really sad and having a difficult time because then people move in and hold you or hug you or express warmth towards you. And maybe you don't have much warmth coming at you except when things are going badly. And so you get reinforced for that. Uh, you might get reinforced for um, fear because after you practice, after you express yourself, you run, you, as I was describing, then you learn that you did okay. So now you've been reinforced for fear for, or let's say I used to have the fear of public speaking. And when I did, and I've talked about it one, in one previous podcast, somewhere in all those 80 podcasts I've done is, is a story about uh, me uh, getting treatment for public speaking anxiety because I used to uh, get very anxious and I would uh, compulsively over-prepare. I mean, painfully 
almost make myself sick compulsively over preparing for giving a talk, whether it was a big talk or a little talk to a lot of people or not very many people, it just sort of shook me. And so I would compulsively over prepare and then I'd be exhausted and I'd give the talk and then I'd get good feedback for it. And then um, that feedback would be would basically be say, registering in my brain as thank God you compulsively over prepared because it went okay, even though you're exhausted. And so then am I going to, what am I going to do next time? I'm going to still, I'm going to be afraid again that if I don't compulsively over prepare, a disaster is going to happen. And the more I do it, the more I get caught in that pattern. So um, how you express your emotions, what you do with that becomes a, another uh, factor that can perpetuate the problem rather than solve it. Um, so it isn't that anything's that uh, expressions are wrong or that action urges are wrong or that interpretations are wrong. They're all natural. It's just that some of these things become your nemesis. Uh, and if you can diagnose which of these factors is really doing you in, then you have a little bit more guidance for where you should focus your attention to try to change your chronic pattern of emotion or response of a certain type of emotion. Final thing. Um, is uh, it can really uh, be harder to regulate your emotions if you don't have skills to regulate your emotions. Um, that's sort of, I guess, the whole point of this, but it's still worth mentioning is that sometimes um, we get up, you know, up, up the creek without a paddle. We're, 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 we don't have the equipment we need to cope with the currents that we get carried into or trapped into. And if only we knew what to do, we'd actually be able to do it. Many, many clients that go through DBT, many, many clients all over the world, often say things like, my oh God, I wish I had known these things when I was younger. Why didn't somebody teach me these things? That, that there are things to do that once you practice them and you can do them, you can actually, you don't have to just sort of like put up with being trapped in all of your emotional responses. It can take some work. But if you've got the skills uh, to do it and the, and the sort of insight or uh, observational capacity to see what you're doing, then it, you, might, you might be able to uh, get, develop more confidence that you're going to be able to uh, transform an emotional experience instead of just having to ride through it and sort of be beat up by it. You might be caught in it and suffer from it. So um, that just loops me back around to the whole point of this podcast is this model of emotions, what I said at the beginning, by analogy, is like the architecture of an emotion or the anatomy of an emotion, the flow of an emotion. If you know all of these components and, how, and see how they interact and how they sort of feed back on each other and affect each other, and you're, ha and you're struggling with a certain chronic anger or shame or fear or sadness or something that is just you just wish you could do something about it. you just get caught in it over and over again then if you can break it down in this way like into its ingredients you might say then you can look at each of the ingredients and ask yourself is this perpetuating the problem or is this sort of like okay um, and it's possible that certain parts are really problematic that you really your mind you have the kind of mind that gets out of control with obsessing about something and you might have to learn to do, do more things about that once you realize that is a huge culprit. Or maybe you're a person who gets caught in an action urge, you're an impulsive kind of person, you get caught there and you just never get out of this cycle and then it generates another problem. Um, all right. I'm going to stop there uh, for the podcast today. And I just want to tell you whether you're interested or not. I want you to know that if you did find this interesting and you want to take it a step further and hear some very practical ways to make use of this model in trying to deal with emotions, that's the focus of the next podcast, which is going to be as planned, unless something comes up, it'll be next week, March 11th. Um, and I'll be joined by three therapists from Clearview Treatment Center in uh, Los Angeles, California, uh, in a women's treatment program there, people who've been doing skills training for years. And, and we had this idea together when I was talking with them that wouldn't it be cool to uh, have them come and really kind of like talk about how they can use or how they do use 
the model of emotions uh, to address very concrete emotional issues. Okay, so that's that'll be next week. So thanks for paying attention, and uh, yeah, I hope um, I hope you're safe wherever you are. And uh, uh, I'm biased in the direction of when when you when your time comes to get vaccinated, uh, please do that. Uh, it'll help make everybody safer, uh, and uh, all of us will perpetuate ourselves into the future so it's good to uh it's good to be able to present this to you and um and to follow up on it next week with uh sort of digging in a little more practical level okay so take care i'm going to stop now look at this i'm four minutes early how unusual for me <laughs>